All right, hey class, how are we doing today? Um, so I'm just here to introduce our first speaker. Uh, today, first up, we have Mr. Jonathan Parfrey. Uh, Mr. Parfrey is the director of Green LA, and he's also on the board of commissioners of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, really exciting talk today, so please give a warm welcome to Mr. Jonathan Parfrey. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. It's been a long day, what can I say? Um, I have a few questions before we start, uh, just a, a kind of curiosity. So how many people here uh, born and raised in Southern California? Oh, good majority, all right. How many from Central California, Northern California? Oh, a few turncoats, all right, good to see you. All right, and then uh, another question. How many people here are not registered to vote? They haven't done it. Are you an, are, and the reason why is you're an anarchist, is that no, it? Or? You're calling them out. I'm calling you out. All right, so uh, I'm hoping that all of you, uh, if you're not registered to vote, it's, it's a good thing to get registered. That's just my two cents, because then you have a say in your government, because that's what I'm going to be talking about today, is uh, Southern California's uh, utilities, uh, where our water comes from, where our power comes from, and the role of of nonprofits and how social change actually happens in the environmental arena. Small topics, yeah, hardly anything. So I want to paint a visual first. So for those of you who are in Southern California, this is why I asked the question. Think about the LA River or the San Gabriel River or the Santa Ana River. A lot of these have bike paths next to them, so it's kind of easy to, some of you may have gone down them. Okay. Before uh, the Europeans got here, in those waters, there would be uh, steelhead trout and salmon that would swim up from, like, Bayona Wetlands area or around San Pedro for the LA River. It would swim up by where downtown is located, go into the Arroyo Seco around Highland Park, go on up around Pasadena, go up the mountain streams, and lay their eggs up in the San Gabriel Mountains. Hard to believe, huh? And the same with the uh, San Gabriel River, going in around where Seal Beach and Long Beach are located, would enter the, from the ocean there, swim upstream through the San Gabriel Valley, go into the Santa Anita Canyon, San Gabriel River canyons, up into the hills, lay their eggs, salmon and steelhead. And then greeting them up in those mountains would be uh, grizzly bears. So we had the same kind of ecosystem as Alaska. Now our grizzlies were, you know, a little smaller than the brown bears they have up there. But essentially the same dynamic right here in Southern California. And when the first um, missionaries came through and they were writing in their journals, and we have copies of their journals today, they're located up in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And I, was, I went in there, I read them, they're amazing. And one of the things they talk about is traveling from one mission to another. So they went from uh, San Buenaventura, Ventura, down to uh, San Gabriel Mission. And in the day it took them to travel that, those miles, 60 miles or so, they were in the shade of oak trees the entire way. And that was our native land. I've heard the mayor, who I respect a great deal, describe Los Angeles as a desert. Well, it's not a desert. It's a coastal sage scrub Mediterranean climate, a Mediterranean climate. You know, we do get, you know, a, a moderate amount of rain. A, a desert uh, gets much less rain. And, but the West is an arid place. And that is a very important thing to understand, and I think here in Los Angeles, with the declarations of, of drought that have taken place recently, we're beginning to understand it a lot more. And so we have to understand where our water comes from. Indigenously, uh, the groundwater in Southern California, in the LA area, can support around a half a million people. And right now we have like 11 or 12 million people. And so, any good empire, you go to distant places, you grab their resources, and you t bring them into your own region. And indeed, that's what's happened in Southern California. So, have, 
people here seen the movie Chinatown? Some of you? Yes. Jack Nicholson? Oh, go see it. It's really good. But it kind of, in a way, describes the development of Los Angeles and how a property was purchased up in the Owens Valley in the Eastern Sierra. Have some of you ever traveled up Highway 395? Beautiful Sierra Mountains. It's absolutely gorgeous. And what the Department of Water and Power, my, my department, which I'm a commissioner, what we've done over the last you know, 100 years is that we went in and we bought up the property there so that we would have the water rights. And we would take the water before it would flow into a lake or into the river. We'd put it in an aqueduct and bring it down here to Los Angeles. So it could support millions of people rather than just half a million people. And so the aqueduct was completed around 1915, and it's been uh, serving Los Angeles uh, ever since. As a matter of fact, it was in the news recently that one of our big trunk lines exploded around uh, Coldwater Canyon and Ventura Boulevard. Some of you may have seen that in the news. And that uh, trunk line was it's like 90 some years old. So it will tell you that there was this infrastructure that was put in place in order to bring water into uh, the city of Los Angeles. So for the city of LA, we get around today much less water than we used to from the Eastern Sierra. We get about 25% of our water from the Eastern Sierra. And then uh, we get about 35% of our water from the Western Sierra. Now, some of you have driven up Interstate 5. You go over the grapevine, and you see that big lake up there, Pyramid Lake. And then you go, how did that water get here? Well, there's a pump uh, that pumps the water up 2,000 feet. And that brings the state water project water into Southern California, into Pyramid Lake. And as it falls into Castaic Lake, believe it or not, the Department of Water and Power has a hydro plant to actually uh, retrieve some of the energy it took to pump it up is retrieved. And then what we do at night when the electricity is really cheap, this is a cool thing, we pump the water back up and reharvest it during the afternoon so that we actually um, are taking advantage of storing energy that we get cheaply at night and then we deliver it during the day. So that's the state water that comes into LA. That's around 35%. And then we get about 25% of our water from the Colorado River. We're members of a Metropolitan Water District. In fact, DWP is really the founder of the Metropolitan Water District. And so we get then about 10% of our water from the local uh, groundwater in Southern California. And then somewhere around 5% of our water today comes from recycled water. And we're, we're using that on uh, golf courses for industrial uses, and that number of recycled water is going to increase and increase. So when you think about it, the Colorado River water comes all the way from Wyoming. So there could be snow falling on the Wind River Range in Wyoming, in the Inner Mountain West. It comes down the Green River, hits up with the Colorado River, goes into uh, Lake Mead, then uh, comes into around needles where it gets uh, pulled off in an aqueduct to come into Southern California. And then there's uh, snow that falls around Tioga Pass in Yosemite National Park. I don't know if you've ever been up there. It's, God, it's so beautiful up there in the Eastern Sierra. In this beautiful Eastern Sierra, that water comes down and we end up using it here in Southern California. And then the water that falls on Half Dome in Yosemite Valley. That water goes into the Merced River, flows into the San Joaquin, and then it gets piped down into Southern California. And, uh, and then in the San Gabriel Valley, sometimes you see snow that's on Mount Baldy or in some of the other mountains or rainfall. And some of that is captured mostly in the, for the city of LA in the uh, eastern part of the San Fernando Valley, uh, an area um, around Sunland to Hunga. So, Capturing stormwater is actually a very good use of our resources because there's sort of a joke about rain in the western United States. It's like when the rain falls in anywhere in the western United States, it's captured and then ported into, uh, imported into Los Angeles. But when the rain falls in LA, what do we do with it? We immediately slough it off and send it out into the ocean. 
through these big, you know, stormwater systems and through our rivers. It's kind of crazy. Why aren't we capturing our rainfall? Like if it falls here, it's not good enough. So the idea is that we should capture our own rainwater. And there's a lot of innovative ways of doing that. There are some people who capture it off of their home rooftop uh, and they're able to put it into like a, a, some kind of a basin, a catch basin and, or a barrel and then use it to water the garden. And that's nice for a home. You know, there's an idea of a cistern where you can capture a great deal of water. The group tree people is really pushing the idea of cisterns. I like that idea. But, you know, something, sometimes there's something about when people work together and they do a big project. And so out in Sunland Tahunga, there are some really exciting projects right now where there are these old mines that exist out there. And potentially within a few years, what we'll be able to do, these enormous gravel pits, we'll be able to capture the stormwater, store it in the gravel pits, and slowly recharge the aquifer in the San Fernando Valley. And that's what I'm looking forward to. But it costs money. But that'll save so much more water than, you know, all these volunteers in scattered places around LA. So I think that's going to be very exciting when we get to that. Um, we have a problem, though, uh, right now with our uh, San Fernando Valley uh, aquifer, is that it's been the site of a lot of industrial pollution. And so have you guys heard of Superfund sites? Of course you have. This is an environmental group. Okay. So, a uh, super fun site is, uh, is especially damaged areas that require uh, federal action to help them get cleaned up. And to clean up the San Fernando Valley, uh, at DWP, we're assuming it's going to cost somewhere between $700 million and $1.2 billion uh, to, to clean it up. And that's to have a water treatment facility out there that would really take all the junk that's in the water and get rid of it. By the way, the junk that's there, this is a very important fact. Uh, the Superfund site is largely uh, the responsibility of the Lockheed uh, aerospace firm, uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, for years, around the Burbank Airport, they were building um, airplanes. And a lot of these airplanes were airplanes that were used during the Cold War. There's a plane called the P-3 Orion that they made out of Lockheed and Burbank. And the P-3 Orion, was hovers very slowly and it was hovering off the coast of California during the decades of the Cold War with a nuclear weapon on board. And it was waiting for an order from uh, its commander to drop that nuke on the Soviet submarines that were off the coast of Los Angeles. And so this game was being played out for decades right off of our coast in Southern California. Crazy days that I lived through and thank God you guys don't have to. But these, these planes, the P-3 Orions, they took the sheet metal, they had to bend it into the form to create the planes, and when you bend metal, you need grease so it doesn't snap, and so they'd grease it down, and they'd have these, these um, enormous machines that would bend the metal into a round shape, and then you had to get the grease off. And so they used these horrible solvents for decades, decades, in Southern California to get the grease off of the airplane parts. And so most of the Superfund sites in LA is junk to get grease off of airplane parts. It's true. And that were used during the Cold War. And so out in uh, the San Fernando Valley, there's Lockheed uh, Martins. Uh, out in the San Gabriel Valley, there's the Aerojet facility. There's a Superfund site there. Uh, up at the Jet Propulsion Lab, there's a Superfund site there. Um, out around Downey, that's a horribly polluted place. It's not a super fun site, maybe it should be. Um, and then around Long Beach, horribly polluted from military production. So most of the military production has resulted in this, in this damage. So when people talk about the cost of going to war, sometimes you don't think about the environmental costs on the people that then have to spend billions and billions of dollars to clean up afterwards. It's very interesting. Okay, that's just an aside. So that's just. The San Fernando Valley, to clean it up, is going to be very, very expensive. So our water comes in as you're driving up Interstate 5 out around the town of Silmar. Have you guys driven up uh, I-5 and you see those steps that come down? And that's where William Mulholland stood in 1913. And he said to the mayor, there it is, take it. 
It's one of the great lines of classic LA lore, you know, about the, the water coming in from Owens Valley. There it is, take it. I have to say it was a great day when the president of the DWP commission, David Nahai, went to Owens Valley and we had, for the first time, rewatered their river a few years ago and David Nahai says, there it is, take it back. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. That was historic knowledge, quite literary. But um, the water comes in down those steps. We actually harvest the falling water for energy most of the time. Uh, we have small hydro plants scattered throughout the entire way of coming down from the Owens Valley into Los Angeles. We then have a massive filtration plant right next to the LA Reservoir. So if you're traveling up I-5, you see the stairs on your right, there's a massive reservoir on your left, there's a filtration plant there that cleans out the water for the city of LA. And that's where we take the water from both Owens Valley and from the Metropolitan Water District that we buy from the State Water Project that comes into LA. So, um, what we're trying to do is um, use more recycled water, too. Remember I said there was around 5% recycled water. We want that number a lot higher. And I'm happy to report that by 2019, the water treatment facilities in the San Fernando Valley, in Glendale, and at the harbor will be completely subscribed with the recycled water through something called purple pipes, which is, they're purple. They're, <laughs> but they're, it's not water that's potable. And the purple pipe tells you it's not potable. And then these pipes will take it and use them for uh, landscaping use and also for industrial use. But here's the most important thing, is that there is one enormous facility, the Hyperion uh, uh, Water Treatment Facility. There is a, we haven't figured out what to do with that yet. There's around 350 million gallons that flow out into the ocean every day. Let me, let me go back, let me describe this to you because it's kind of scatological and fun to learn about what happens to your crap after it goes down the toilet, okay? So here, we're going to walk through this. Have you guys heard this lecture already? Stop me. You want to hear about where your shit goes? Yeah. All right, all right, all right. So, um, the sewage gets taken down in this part of the city, in the vast part of Los Angeles, and even cities of Santa Monica, Culver City, and everything. It goes down to the Hyperion facility, which is right next to uh, uh, LAX. Have you guys uh, been down to LAX or driven on the, the bike path along the coast there? And so there's LAX, and then there's a kind of big facility with a lot of lights, very futuristic. That's Hyperion. And right next to this, the Scattergood power plant, which is part of DWP. So what happens at Hyperion is that they take the... Uh, they call it, they, they, they take the crap and then they, they biodigest it. There are these little bugs that work on it to capture the methane. The methane gets pulled out and it gets sent next door to the Scattergood power plant where it's mixed in with natural gas and it becomes our lights in the city of Los Angeles. So we are using part of our shit to keep the lights on. That's pretty good, right? And then what happens is that the, then after that treatment of the methane and, and the bugs eating it, and it, it turns into something called biosolids. And then there's 30 dump trucks a day. 30. Take the biosolids. Nice word for it, right? And you go up over the, the, over the grapevine into Bakersfield. And about 30 miles outside of Bakersfield is where cotton is grown using LA's biosolids. So, we've been thinking about this. There have been some people who have really given it some thought. And we thought, well, you know, maybe we could market this, but these biosolids. We could call it like shit of the stars, you know? Like we could sell it across the country because people want a little piece of Hollywood that they can call their own. All right, this is being, this is on, this is being taped. I'm going to get in trouble. This is terrible. And then... Um, but what we, there is an, uh, an innovative plan that is actually happening. And so the water that then goes out to the ocean is in large measure denuded of a lot of the contamination that was present. And it's been filtered out. And so what's going out into the ocean is called primary treated water and around 300, 350 million gallons a day. 
And what is ultimately hoped with this water is that it can be further treated, to, to be treated, tertiary treated, take it over to a place that is around where the 405, there's a, and the, um, the 405 and the 110 meet. And there's an ability to store that water in the aquifer there. And then, after years of being filtered by the soil and naturally cleaned, it could then be served for potable purposes. You may not know this, but in Orange County, they are using recycled water today. I mean, they are. Orange County is beating the hell out of LA when it comes to recycled water. They get water from the Santa Ana River, um, which also used to once have steelhead and salmon and grizzly bears up in the Santa Ana Mountains uh, and in the, um, in the San Bernardino Mountains. And uh, they are treating uh, their water for, for, to then recharge it into the uh, uh, aquifer around Brea. So they take the water, it comes down into the Irvine Newport area, it gets treated there. Microfil microfiltration, the width about the size of a human hair, and then they hit it with reverse osmosis, and then they have hydrogen peroxide, and they have uh, UV light, and it, it nukes everything. That water is more pure than the water that we get out of the Colorado River. And so then that water gets pumped back up to around Anaheim Brea area, and then it gets recharged. And actually, it gets a little bit dirtier when we mix it with what comes out of Santa Ana. So it's one day, we hope, that the public will feel good enough about having what's called flange to flange recycling. But once it gets treated, reverse osmosis, it takes everything out of there. UV light, hydrogen peroxide treated, it's uh, the best water that, that you could possibly get. It could go directly into the water system. We're not there yet. There's an uck factor that people haven't quite gotten over. But one day, we, might, we very well may be there. Um, so we're hoping to come up with a solution to those 350 million gallons a day that we just, perfectly good water, that we just discharge. So uh, one of the things that we do, once the water comes into Silmar and once it's treated, it goes to different reservoirs around Los Angeles. And I bet some of you have seen these reservoirs. So Silver Lake Reservoir, some of you guys seen that? Uh, yes, we got someone from Silver Lake. Whew. Ivanhoe, uh, Rowena, um, Echo Park used to be once a reservoir. That was something that used to deliver potable water. I would perish the thought now, but that was once online. Um, we have Stone Canyon above Bel Air. Right above UCLA is a massive reservoir that holds more water, actually, than the LA reservoir. Uh, there's one in uh, all, over, all over town, and there are these massive trunk lines that are over six feet wide, rushing water uh, throughout the city at all times. Uh, at DWP, uh, we know that we're in a drought, so we called upon uh, Angelinos to start conserving water. And the mayor uh, announced that we were going to have different tiers of water payments. So if you're really um, uh, scrimping on the amount of water that you use, then you will pay not only less for volume, but less total. But if you really waste water, you will be charged extra once you go above a certain tier. That's how we know that you're wasting water. And so by sending a price signal that is when you really get people to change their behavior. They're paying more. They go, oh, I better go back and change things. We also put in what's called phase three restrictions, which means that you can only water on Mondays and Thursdays and only before, in the, uh, before 9 a.m. and after 5, only in the morning and the evening. And because of these measures, I'm here to tell you that Angelinos have saved over 10 billion gallons of water over the summer months. And now that we're into, that's not counting September, October. So just people on their own hearing about it, doing the right thing, we have saved like the equivalent of what the city of Long Beach uses an entire year just in LA. It's rocking. It's good. So that's good. So there are also incentives that we offer that unfortunately we have a rotten website. We're working on it. We want people to really get a sense of, yes? I was going to say, um, will that, is that going to become a permanent thing because so much was saved? Or will that end when the, when the drought is over? 
Um, the mayor is convinced that we're in a permanent uh, drought situation. But uh, because it's El Nino right now, there is a possibility that we could get a wet year and we can move from phase three to maybe phase two, which would allow watering during another day of the week. Or we could possibly relax the phases and then put them back in once the dry months hit, like let's say in April or May. See, these. I can weigh in with my decision to keep going the way we're going, but there are other people at, there's, I'll get into this in a little while. These things don't happen in a vacuum. There are a lot of neighborhood councils and homeowner associations that are very upset with DWP in these water restrictions. They would love to see these things relaxed and that they can use as much water as they like. But I think that sends a very bad message. I think that people have to get adjusted to the fact that we're entering into a whole other reality when it comes to climate change. And we need to make these preparations. And finally, we need to live within the limits of our Mediterranean climate, that ecosystem that we live in. You know, we really shouldn't act like we're you know, living in northern France or something. We're, we're living in a Mediterranean climate, and we should have that kind of a garden that can be sustained by what happens here indigenously. Yes? There are some ball fields that uh, there are exceptions, and also recycled water is a complete exception. So what we're hoping, even for UCLA, and this is an idea, maybe you guys can run with this, is to have sort of like a satellite primary water treatment facility. So it can take some of the wastewater off of the campus, immediately treat it, and then use that immediately treated water for a lot of the ball fields and a lot of the landscaping and so that doesn't even go down to Hyperion. You guys are using it right here. But right now, we're using some purple pipe. Actually, I think it, it's either getting to UCLA now or in a little while. And you guys should look into that to see if the purple pipe has hit, has, has hit UCLA just yet. So there are incentives that we're offering. Um, they're pretty exciting uh, incentives. Like if you tear up your lawn, we'll give you a buck per square foot. Like here, do it. Put in some zero scape. Uh, if you put in drip irrigation, put in a garden with drip irrigation. Boom! It's almost. It, it doesn't pay for it, but it gets you at least part of the way there. So this is how we're trying to get households to to swap out some of their uh, wasteful appliances and their uh, wasteful like shower heads and toilets. Right now. Toilets should be dual flush and at most 1.2 gallons. There are some toilets, I bet on this campus, that are four gallons per flush. I would bet anything. Oh, they're all 2.5? Most of them are 2.5. But still, there can be an improvement. Can you explain what dual flush is? Yeah. Uh, since I've been scatological already. OK, so, <laughs> so if it's just urine, you just, it just does a very small, like a few pint flush. And then if it's number two, you push another button and that carries that away. So water quality. Because we have water that we essentially take from the Sierra Nevada mountains, our water quality is superb. There are many places in Southern California, especially in the Central Valley, that get their water from their own aquifers. And so the water there is oftentimes contaminated with pesticides and other horrible toxicants. And I want you to reflect on what pesticides are. Pesticides is a chemical designed to kill a multicellular organism. And the idea that we think that it won't have an effect on us because we're bigger is, is a, a sense of a fantasy that we're in. So these are, these are designer poisons that we have to make sure that we use in the most limited fashion. And that is simply not the case, especially in the areas where there's a lot of agriculture. There is a small town within LA County that's called Maywood. This town uh, has around 60,000 people in it. And their water is delivered by a private firm, a water agency that has these rights that date back like 80, 90 years. The water that comes out of the tap in this largely poor Latino community is brown. It's, it's the color of dark tea and or light coffee. Take your pick. And people are supposed to to bathe in this stuff. It's just horrible. And so working with state legislators and others, a lot of environmental activists have been taking on the terrible water quality 
that's in Maywood. But in LA, we have great water. So water bottles, you know, all you need is a canteen because you know you might want to we put we dose it with some chlorine to make sure there's no chloroform, there's no bacteria in the water, that we get rid of the algae that might be present in the water. The water quality is superb in LA. There is no reason to buy bottled water. None at all. In fact, you can save a lot of money by having a canteen. Thank you. I see the canteen. Beautiful. Loving it. So that is actually a wonderful campaign that we're hoping to have actually on campus is to identify all of the drinking fountains on campus. We're working with uh, one of your schools. Oh, God, I don't but it's to identify all the drinking fountains and to see if a canteen would work at that drinking fountain. And so that people can simply take advantage of the water that's naturally here. All right. It's called the Department of Water and Power. So let me talk about the, the, the energy side. I, I gave a talk about uh, a year ago. and. I described the power situation. A very smart young man raised his hand and he said, I didn't know our energy came from these far-flung places. I thought it came from those like substations I saw. So this guy thought our energy came from those little substations that are around. No, it does not. Our energy comes from uh, burning uh, coal in the desert. Um, there are two. Uh, very large uh, power generation stations out in the desert, one in central Utah and the other one in um, near the Four Corners area near the Navajo Reservation. In fact, it's called the Navajo Facility uh, near in the Colorado River in Page, Arizona. And so 44% of our energy, almost half of our energy, comes from burning coal in uh, the Los An city of Los Angeles. About 30% comes from natural gas today. 10% comes from nuclear power. And about 14% comes from renewables. And then there's some that comes from Hoover Dam that's large hydro. That's in 2009. And so what this mayor has done that I'm very proud to be associated with his administration, he has said that we're getting off of coal by 2020. And by the time that Antonio Villaraigosa is out of office, we will have the contracts in place, the agreements in place to be off of uh, being off of burning coal. And it, it's exciting because in Southern California, we don't have like large hydro. Like if, you, if, we, if this was Seattle or Portland, you know, they have these enormous rivers, you know, buzzing through and they're able to capture their energy from the rivers. We don't have that luxury. Uh, and so in many arid places, you have to turn, people have in the past turned to coal. And now, um, so we're going to be at 20% renewables next year. 20% renewables. And in 2020, we're going to be at 40% renewables in the city of LA. And there's a big if associated with all this. And I'll tell you what that if is later. So what is the uh, renewables? What are, we, what are we doing right now? And so most of our renewables today are coming from wind power. Uh, wind in the Tehachapi Mountains, uh, going uh, up uh, above this town of Mojave, above the city of Mojave, up in those mountains. Uh, we are also having wind come in from uh, Utah and wind come in from the Columbia Gorge. Now, why have the wind come in from so far a distance? Because you actually want to have a diversified portfolio so that if one, the wind stops kicking up in one area, you have its replacement in another area. In fact, if we're going to get to that 40% renewables by 2020, what we're going to want to do is bring in wind from the Great Basin states, like Wyoming, eastern Utah, where it's blowing uh, almost 24-7. There are some tremendous opportunities of bringing that into Los Angeles, where it really meets our loads uh, here in LA. We also get uh, some of our energy from uh, biogas. I described what we're doing at the Hyperion power plant. We get some from uh, geothermal and we get some from uh, landfill gases that we end up burning in our uh, natural gas uh, facilities. We also have some from small hydro 
If you're under 30 megawatts, it's considered a small, it's considered a renewable power source, and you can count that. Now, you've noticed I didn't mention solar. Because right now, what we've done is sort of a rich man solar game in Los Angeles. If you had enough money, DWP would give a wealthy homeowner some money to put solar on the roof. And you had to be wealthy because how else can you afford the $15,000, $20,000, $25,000, $30,000 to put solar on your roof? And so we, we want to change all that. And here are some of the policies that are being put into place. First of all, uh, we want to do put solar out on city-owned properties in a huge way. Get the utility to do it. We want 400 megawatts of solar that's going to be on city property installed by city personnel. That's the first plank of the mayor's solar program. The second plank is to help homeowners actually make money off of the deal. So when the meter starts running backwards, there's something called net metering, where people get a refund for the amount of energy that they're using, that they're contributing to the system. We want to be able to pay them. So that's being re-energized. Third plank is something called a feed-in tariff, which is that idea of net metering when you produce too much and you feed it back. But this is for businesses. Let's say it's a Ralph supermarket, uh, or it's uh, Home Depot, or it's LAUSD. They have a lot of roof space. And so, but they want to run the meter back significantly. And that program is called feed-in tariff. And so that's part of it. And then there's another part that is large solar, which is looking to the desert. Now, everything I've described is kind of like, especially on rooftops in Los Angeles. Just think about this with me. These are custom jobs. These are rooftops that are maybe, you know, like 20 feet by 30 feet. And then another one might be 20 by 15. And another one might be 30 by 35. And, and so every single time, you need someone to fit it in on a roof. And then there has to be a legal relationship between the utility and the installer and the municipality. And there has to be liability having to do with the rooftop. And there's a guy walking around on the roof. And he might fall off of something. He might fall into something. There's nails going through. It might rain. And get in there. OK. Do you see how complex it gets just to put solar on a rooftop and how expensive a custom job is? And that's what's good about putting solar actually on the land. And I know it sounds like we're competing with habitat, and I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the beautiful places in the desert where they're the desert tortoises or, um, or any other you know, real habitat that can be used. We're talking about the places in the desert that are close to civilization, that are not in beautiful wilderness, that can be used for generating electricity on a massive scale and then brought into uh, major cities like Los Angeles. If we're going to beat this global warming thing, and LA is America's second largest city, we have to start throwing down in a big way. And doing solar on a massive scale is the way of doing that. So um, that is something that. Uh, we need uh, people to, to recognize how important that is and to throw down behind that. There's also some amazing geothermal potential in California, uh, out in the area around the Salton Sea, where our continent, or the California, is ripping apart. The Pacific Plate is ripping off from the North American Plate. There's a tremendous amount of energy that gets released uh, through this incredible seismic activity. And so they're already. Uh, some geothermal plants uh, in the area around the San Andreas Fault out there. Uh, we are also looking at geothermal up in the Owens Valley in Mono County. There's a lot of seismic activity up there, as well as in Utah. And there's this other idea of desert solar. I just wanted to introduce you to it, if you didn't know about it already. It's called solar thermal, or concentrated solar, where water or some other uh, liquid is superheated, and it drives a turbine. So you're almost using the planet's heat uh, as a way of producing electricity that might even fuel air conditioners somewhere. It's kind of ingenious. And so there are other ways of dealing with biomass. I told you about Hyperion, but we have a lot of trash in LA. And a lot of it can be biodigested by bugs, and it can be converted into methane, and then it can be used to uh, burn and operate turbines. So right now, to be able to get to these incredibly important new 
uh, uh, areas of solar development, of geothermal development, of wind power development, uh, we have to pay for it. Because if we're going to stop global warming, it's just not going to magically happen. Sure, energy efficiency is great, and we're investing a lot in energy efficiency. When Villaraigosa got in, there was only four million bucks being spent on energy efficiency. There were only 13 gigawatt hours saved when he got in. And now we're up to like 350 gigawatt hours saved. And we're spending like $90 million a year, and it's paying us back continuously. And we're going to even put more into uh, energy efficiency. The street lights in LA, we're swapping out those halogen bulbs, and we're putting in LEDs. It's going to save, you know, hundreds of millions of gigawatt hours over the course of the lifetime of swapping these things out. There's some good stuff happening, but we have opposition because we are in a hard economic times. There are some people who say it's too much to spend the money to try to avert global warming. We just can't do it. I hear this at the commission. There are people who are opposing us spending money on wind power, on geothermal, on solar. And I have to be candid with you. I'm not hearing the voices coming to the commission, not coming to city council in demanding that these funds uh, are spent. So when I describe the utility solar of putting solar out in the city-owned properties, getting out there 400 megawatts, first solar plant out of the gate, it would be on an average bill a dollar a month. A dollar a month, and we have people fighting us on it, fighting us. They don't want to pay a dollar a month to fight global warming. So um, global warming is, is truly uh, happening. It's truly real. Uh, we are dealing with, in this last century, we had a two Fahrenheit increase uh, here in the state of California. And that's state of California data. It's anticipated it will be somewhere in the order of, at the low end, two degrees increase in this century up to eight degrees. It's significant. Uh, we can anticipate sea level rises. The port of Los Angeles and the port of Long Beach, the economic engine of Southern California, absolutely positively, the strongest economic boost that we get is from the import and export of goods. And right now, that, this, the ports are at sea level, and the infrastructure is at sea level. What are we going to do when uh, these are threatened by the rise in sea levels. Uh, it's thought that there will be an increase in tropical diseases, things like dengue fever, um, malaria, were supposed to be things that are only consigned to tropical countries. They could very well be introduced into Southern California. Heat stroke uh, is going to be commonplace. There could be much more prolonged heat waves happening over weeks rather than just a short period of time. Increased fires. I thought almost all of the LA burned down this last fire. You know, that's going to get even worse. So this is very real and it affects our lives. And so we have to fight uh, for our future. And we have to say that we're making a smart investment today because the cost of not doing something is far greater than any sacrifice we would make today to pay for it. So I hope I've convinced you that we need to invest in these renewables, and that would be a very good thing. So how does environmental change happen? Um, sometimes it's just personal behavior. I know really great people, they don't own a car, they just have a bike. And they get anywhere in LA by just jumping on a bike. And they jump on a bus, they jump on a train, they jump on their bike, they've gotten rid of a car. That's a personal behavior. I know people who live in a commune, and they share resources. And so their carbon footprint per capita, man, it's super low. And I think that's great. I admire that. But there's more. Um, there's a way of affecting change is through uh, making change big, through policy, through uh, working with your legislators, through enacting new policies. And that's the role of nonprofit organizations. The nonprofit organizations can be, there's sort of a continuum. You can start with being um, visionary. You have the over the horizon ideas, where you don't see how to get there. It's over the horizon, it's difficult to get to, but you're trying to get there. And you offer a vision for people on how to get there. So that can be 
you know, getting down to 350 you know, parts per million of CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. Right now we're at, what, 380, 390? But how do we ratchet down? How do we get below 350 uh, into the future? Uh, you offer that vision for people. And then there's the next valley. It's not over the horizon, it's the next valley. You're developing something. Plans are coming together. There's an idea of how to get from here to there, but it's just not clear. And then in the legislative process, you go from over the horizon, the vision, to the next valley, preliminary planning, ideas, to the last mile. And that's where most nonprofit organizations really excel, which is make the policy happen, push it through, get a law passed, get an ordinance passed, get a resolution passed, push it through. And that is the role that a lot of people can do, taking the lead. But when you do that, that last mile, boy, that's where you get the opposition. But it's still very important. And then there's the stage of implementation and the actual action related to that. And, and all of this, this sort of continuum from over the horizon to the next valley to the last mile to the implementation stage is a role that people can play. We need visionaries and we need realists. We need people who are willing to act. It's a continuum, but I think that's what's really important. That's what's called for uh, today, is to have people get involved, people get engaged, and uh, that's it. I hope, I hope you have any questions.